We're going to start a new project sent in by Randall from the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design. And it is this really bitchin' little cubic thing. This is our first 3D printed object. And uh, I'm sure there are going to be more of those in the future. Others are starting to come in. 3D printing is just too interesting to ignore and too helpful and too handy to mold makers. Uh, one of the things about 3D printing is that it's still very slow. And if you want to make an addition of something, it's very often faster to cast it in resin than it is to print it over and over again on a 3D printer, because I, I haven't asked Randall how long this took, but I'll bet it took some hours to print this piece. Whereas if we make the mold correctly and we rotocast them, uh, we could generate a part, certainly at, at least an hour or less of time, and a lot of that's just waiting around for resin to cure. Anyway, this is a rotational molding project. Randall wants a hollow casting, and as a rotational molding project, it has a lot of challenges associated with it. Um, the biggest of which are lots and lots of points and sharp corners. Rotational molding does not like sharp corners. If you remember back to the Pug Mug project, uh, link above, uh, one of the difficulties we had was with the fur, uh, getting the process of rotational molding to force the resin into the fur. So we're gonna have to make a mold that we're gonna almost certainly get into and manually force the resin into all of the sharp corners and edges. And then we can go ahead and just sort of rotate the walls. Uh, another aspect of this job that uh, we just have to kind of live with is that there are some artifacts. Let me see if you can see them. There are some artifacts um, on the mold itself. The castings will have the same flaws as the model. And I've always said, take the time, take the energy to make as perfect a model as you can because you know, this is a, a common beginner's mistake is to go, oh, oh, I'll fix it in the casting. And then you realize that, you know, you're not gonna fix it once in the casting, you're gonna fix it every single time in the casting, which means you have to fix the same flaw over and over and over again. That gets old really fast and violates my rule of simple and easy is best. First thing we're gonna do with this cube is clean it up a little bit. I actually really love the texture of the printing on the sides. They, I think they did a great job of taking advantage of the layer lines as they, as they reflect around. They look fantastic. But this is probably the bottom. I'm guessing this is the bottom. This side looks better. It's the top, but still, nonetheless, it's got some flaws, as you can see. There are definite flaws in the print. And I think that if we're going to take the trouble to make a mold, we ought to take the trouble to clean it up first. But it's a material I've never worked with before. I don't even know for sure what kind of printing plastic this is. So I'm gonna to go to the old tried and true. I think to clean up these bottoms, I may just break out the old magic sculpt. Let's see here. I put this aside for a second. And this is just a two part, the old, the old AB business. We all know that, same as, uh, same as a resins. It's just a two part resin and hardener system. So we got that going on. Got some hardener here. This is probably way more than I need because I'm just gonna do a test and see how this is gonna work out. So basically what you do with this stuff, I love epoxy clay. It's one of my absolute favorite things. So what you're supposed to do here is you roll out equal size lumps. Those are not equal size. You don't have to weigh it. You don't have to be too terribly precise about it, uh, but they should be roughly the same size. Those are pretty close. Maybe this one's a hair bigger, but those are close enough. If you've never worked with this stuff before, you should get some because it's bitching. I dig it. We love it. And then we just layer it, layer it, and just knead it up. Now, you never want to knead up more than this stuff than you can use at one time because when this stuff goes off, <laughs> it's rock hard. And I really just want to see how it's going to perform if I, if I smear it into this matrix, into this. Oh, will that work? Is that going to work out? Yeah, I think that might work out all right. I don't really want to make more sanding work for myself than necessary. And I'm really thinking only of filling the kind of big, big gaps in here with Magic Sculpt. Magic Sculpt is a material that I know well. I've used it for years and years, and that's what I like. I like things that I know and I can predict the results on. 
Okay, I'm gonna fast forward you. What I did was I just puttied up these surfaces, but as you can see, I didn't really do that complete a job. I just kind of did the roughest, uh, deepest parts. And the reason for that is what I really wanna do is I want to break out the Bondo. And I'm breaking out the Bondo because I think it'll be easier to sand and finish this just using a much softer material. This uh, Magic Sculpt is rock hard and this stuff's a lot softer. And the good thing is that you know, there are millions and millions and millions of old jalopies all around the world that are basically just glued together with this stuff. Now this is the spot putty. This isn't like the, you know, when they build entire car bodies out of this stuff instead of doing it in metal like they're supposed to. Um, anyway, I'm gonna use this stuff, but here's the thing. I don't know if there's something in this stuff. I don't think so, but I don't know that there's something in this stuff that's gonna mess up my rubber. So what do I do? What do I always preach? What do I always tell you to do? Test, test, test. So what I have done is I poured a little tiny bit of rubber into that little cup, because this is just gonna be a spot test, and I'm actually gonna test a couple of things. I think I know the answer. I think there's not gonna be any problems, but I don't know it. So let's just go ahead and put some hardener into this rubber and make, and make a mix, because I just want a nice little test. What I wanna know in this test is, is this material gonna react in some way with the rubber? That's all I wanna know. Let's find out. But I also, again, I think the answer is probably absolutely not, oops, is not, but I don't know it, and so I wanna test it. So I'm just gonna make a spot test. Just in one corner where it'll be easy to clean up. If the rubber cures up perfectly, then I'm going to putty this thing up with the ever popular, ever lovely Bundo. I sound like a commercial. They're not paying me. Why am I flogging this stuff? They're not paying me. That's what we're going to do. Let's go do it. Well, that's a good sign. Both of them are hard, but you, know, you never know until you know. There may be some cure inhibition. They may bond or do something weird. I don't think so. Okay, that answers the first question. That casts perfectly. So no issue with that material. This plastic's not going to hurt our rubber at all. What about Bondo? What's Bondo gonna do to us? Okay, same deal, no inhibition at all. Interesting that the rubber itself left a mark of some sort on the, rubber, on the uh, Bondo. Doesn't look like it peeled off the Bondo, but see what I mean by weird chemical stuff that can happen to you? This is what I'm talking about. Like, I don't know why that happened. What, what chemicals inside this rubber migrated into that surface? That's an interesting thing. I don't think it's gonna have, give us any problems. It's pearly cured, it's not soggy, it's not weird. So if I put this material on this model, I think we're gonna have a good result. And that's what we needed to find out. So let's go for it. Oh, by the way, I didn't point this out, but if you look on this, I put a little spot of Bondo right here on the corner on this model. Why? Because what would happen if I put the Bondo on and it melted this plastic or did something equally idiotic or it didn't cure or whatever. And let's just begin. I'm going to do this in layers. I'm not going to attempt to build this all up in one shot because Bondo, as with most body filler type, got that polyester kind of smell to it, uh, shrinks when it cures. So it, you usually have to make multiple applications anyway. So knowing that, I'm just gonna be prepared to make multiple applications. I'd rather make a lot of fine applications because they're easier to sand too than to try to do it all in one big thick cake. I never was a big fan of thick layers in most situations. So yes, it's going on really well. Actually, I'm very pleased with how it's going on. Now, this model, we're not gonna achieve perfection. I can tell you already that perfection will elude us. And the point, and the reason is that uh, this is a tutorial about casting and molding this object. It's not about bringing it to a high polish. To make this piece, we're gonna use a hollow casting mold, a little rotation mold. And in order to do it, 
I'm going to make a cut mold, but the trickiest part about this cut mold is I really, really, really want to cut perfectly on this edge and then the same edge on the opposite side. I don't want to cut across this beautiful surface texture it's just because it'll just mangle it. So uh, really the hardest part about making this entire mold <laughs> is going to be me aiming and cutting right on that edge. So that's going to be our big challenge. And in order to do that, let's see, I want to pick up, I want to put the sprue, the pour hole on this top surface. And the reason for that is if I put it up here on this top surface, it'll be super easy to sand it off because this is just harder to sand down in here. So then the next question is where do I run the parting line? If I'm coming from this, this edge here, I've got a little oddity of a parting line here. I've got a definitely going to have a little dingleberry coming across here. So I really should want to come down here and jog over, but that's going to be super tricky to cut. Now you may argue, why not? Wouldn't this be a perfect pl place to do a clay up? Uh, and yeah, you can make an argument that that would be a perfect place to do a clay up. But then with the clay up, you've got all kinds of other problems like this is a really fine surface texture. So if you look super close, you can see the filaments from the 3D printing. And that's a problem because if I put clay against it, those things are going to get clay in there. Then what do I do? How do I clean that off? It's going to make a mess. I really don't want to make a clay up mold on this or a two-part mold on this piece. Okay, so that's that's the question. I know I want to come here. This line is easy. That's a good line. The line on the other side is a problem. The thing about 3D prints is that they have all kinds of printing flaws, and those flaws are going to get beautifully reproduced in the casting. Now, they'll be easy enough to clean up in the casting, but there will be some post-finish. Like, there's a weird little filament business going on here, where one, it's like one filament went wacky as it came out of the, out of the printer. So, there's already a dingleberry right in there that we're going to have to clean up. So, I'm inclined to come down this, this edge, this side, and this edge, which is a nice clean edge on that side. To do that, I want to, I'm going to... Uh, use a uh, technique a little bit similar to the one I use for the pug mug, but slightly different. Now, let me see if I can capture this edge. I'm just transferring what that edge looks like. The length of the edge. Okay. Now, if I, I pick that up. See how I transferred that edge? So I could just copy that. That's as tight as I need it to be. Now let's go over to our funky edge and see if it's completely different or if it's essentially the same. Should be very, very similar, and it is. Okay, all right, so that's our pattern. What we want to do is we're going to want to make a strip of rubber that's maybe three, what, let's call it three quarters of an inch, something like that. So we're going to want to make a strip of rubber like this. This is not have to be precise. And I want it to be another length of rubber, be about that long. And that we could do with a ruler, which I don't have handy, but I do have this beautiful scraper handy. This and this. Yada dee da da. Okay, that is what we are going to copy. So now, Cut that out. Okay, get rid of this. So that is our piece that we want to make. That'll pop back up. Now let's see if I can do this. I got my little pattern beautifully taped up. Didn't take too much effort. So now let's break out the oil clay. Nothing greasier and grimier than oil clay. Ugh, what a mess. Stuff's horrible. Basically what we're doing here is making a dam. Cut a bunch of squares. I'll just be able to lay it on there like that. Oh yeah, that should work. This does not have to be super precise. This is just a dam for the rubber to pour a rubber thing. Now you saw me do something similar in the pug mug video, but there, and when I was in my shop, I did, I made this dam out of wood. 
So I thought this is a good opportunity to show you guys that you can do it just as well out of clay. Again, this does not have to be purdy. All you have to do is be tight. It can't leak. That's its only requirement. You don't want it to leak. If it leaks, it's not going to work. But it shouldn't be too bad to make it leak proof. So I'm just going to keep cutting, cutting cubes until I get to the curvy part, and then I'll have to bend them. I'll just keep going along here doing this. When I do the curvy side, boy, this is crumbly clay. When it's when it is cold like it is, cold and right out of an unworked out of the package, it's pretty crumbly. Okay, I'll put up with you. Put up with your peccadillos. So I'm just going to continue this dam all the way around and then we'll pour some rubber. Well, it won't win the National Sculpting Olympics, but it's going to work. I'm going to cast rubber in it, and I have to make two of them, so I hope it's durable enough to make both castings. Those of you that are new to the channel uh, will probably be completely confused by this, but uh, my returning viewers will know that I'm not in my shop. And, in fact, this is my temporary shop <laughs> for at least for the next couple of weeks. I'm gathering all my supplies together. A friend of mine is loaning me her garage, and that's where I'll be set up permanently for the winter. And uh, so right now, uh, temporarily, <laughs> this is the view out the window of my temporary shop. And I've set up on the patio table with uh, a new toy that I bought that actually I've been testing and it's working well. It's just a little Amazon vacuum pump and chamber system. Uh, and it seems to be working really well. So we're going to use this system to make the blanket mold for the cuboid. Shake, shake, shake. Set on this scale, I don't love this scale. It only measures in five gram increments, and that's not good enough. Let's see what 10 grams looks like. As soon as I hit 10 grams, I'm stopping. Nothing, nothing, nothing. This way, oh, there goes five. Now, as soon as I hit 10, I'll have 10. I don't want to over pour 10. There's 10. All right, 10 grams of that. We got 10, we want to get to 100. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, this thing's heavy. I'm gonna have to hand pour this. This is gonna be not easy, but we'll do our best. Here it comes. 15, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. I'm gonna make a mess on the on this thing. I already know that. Maybe not, maybe I can do something better. I'll try to make a mess inside the cup when I hit 100. Yeah, that's pretty rich, that mix. I can tell you right now, that's a rich mix. All right, let's do a little de-airing. De-air our rubber mix. Throw it in there. Close the outlet valve. As you can see, it's coming up to vacuum. Very nice. Come on up. Okay, let's get the thing out of the tank. All right. Let's fill this mold. All right, let's take a look at our rubber. Let's take a look at what we got going on here. How did we do? How did we do? I don't want to damage the dam if I can avoid it. Can I do it? Can I get it out of there? Ooh, look at that. Just stretch it and pull it right on out. Excellent. Good. That is exactly what we want. And that it's going to lay on there, and that's going to give us our parting line. Perfect. And the long part is going to go across like this. It's going to work out great. All right, time to start putting the print coat on this boy. The print coat is just the coat that captures all of the surface details, bubble free, and makes a perfect surface copy of our model. So that's what we're going to do. How I'm going to start is, I'm going to fill up each one of these wells. On each side, there's kind of a deep well, and I'm just going to begin by filling them up. All right, let's get going. Mixed up a batch of silicone and de-aired it, but I'm going to add something that I haven't shown you guys before, and that is this stuff, which is Rapid Set, and that is a hardening stuff. It's been a while since I used this stuff, so watch me screw it up. This stuff is 
uber powerful. You do not want to overuse it. You have to use it fantastically sparingly. And I mean, we're talking drops here. It's, um, let's see what is the manufacturer. Here I have my handy dandy manufacturer's data sheet. Can't live without them. And it says recommended levels um, for a 30 minute gel time and a two hour cure, four drops per pound. This is a little more than a quarter of a pound. Let's say I wanted a 10 minute gel time and a one hour cure, uh, 12 drops per pound, or that would be around three drops. So I, you know, I'm inclined to see, but to push it a little to see what happens. Worst case scenario is, is I'll have to peel it off the model if something horrible happens. So let's give it literally one, I, that was barely two, three. That was three drops. This is kind of a test batch. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Man, that imparted some smell in there, I think, a little bit. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm insane. That could be too. It's a very strong possibility of insanity. What I want to do is I want to fill this well. As always, I am filling, even though this is just a little well, I am filling from the bottom up. All right, let's see what happens with that. If it drips, it's not gonna hurt anything. It's not gonna bother me much. Let's see if we can't get a lot of print coat put down on this side. The print coat is the most important because it's the one that's gonna dictate the quality of your casting. Well, you know, you take your time and you very, very carefully brush out the surface and try to make sure you don't have any bubbles, any hairs, anything weird. Uh, you know, it just, it has to be as flawless as you can make it. Subsequent coats don't matter as much because if they have bubbles or if they have little flaws or impurities, anything like that, it's away from the casting surface. And since we're not going to pressurize this mold, we don't have bubbles to crush out. So they just don't make any difference. All right, that looks pretty good. Okay, I got all four sides print coated. And uh, by the way, this stuff was fantastic because it really sped up the cure. So this is a really great use for it. I would not use this for pouring a mold because I want to have a lot of open time. Uh, and this really shortens the open time down to just a few minutes, but it also shortens the cure time to like 45 minutes, an hour. So uh, pretty fantastic. I am also made this little mold of our cap. And I just took this plastic, uh, I think it was a eyedropper bottle, something like that, and molded it. And uh, so let me fill this with resin right now. Never been a big fan of weighing out small amounts of resin. Okay, pour that and we'll let that care up. And that is going to be the plug for the bottom of our piece. Yeah, perfect. Nice little uh, Nice little top. Now the question is, where are we gonna put this little plug? If I put it in the middle, then it could be a little bit saggy, you know, it could, could push in, it could deform a little. If looking at it, I think I'm gonna put it near the corner like that. So let's do that. And to do that, we get out the handy dandy waxer, which we love with all our hearts. Can't live without the waxer. Put a little bit of wax on the bottom, stick it on. And then I'm going to locate some blue sprue wax and just do it, make a fillet and run some blue sprue wax down around it. All right, got that pretty well waxed in there. A little bit of wax cleanup to do, not too bad. And of course, in the casting, uh, we're going to cast this little nozzle, and uh, it's going to have to be cleaned off. That's going to be the cleanup. With each casting, you're always going to have that littlest bit of cleanup. But the whole trick to this business is to have the cleanup be as little as possible. We're going to finish out this top and also start building up the extra pieces. That's going to be a laugh riot, let me tell you. And away we go. Now, what we're going to do here is apply this rubber on this surface, brushing it out to make sure that I get a good print coat. And I don't have to worry so much about bubbles that's down in the matrix of the rubber down in the cup because I am brushing it all out. One slight advantage of doing laid up molds is you can brush out the bubbles. They rise away from the surface that you're molding. 
So that's a good thing. I'm just making sure that I really jam the rubber down into the cracks, down into the crevices, so that we don't have any bubbles in the crucial parts. Because boy, I tell you, you catch a bubble down in there and it makes a nice big wart, <laughs> big bubble uh, in the casting. Ugh, such a pain to clean out. Who needs it? So I'm being ultra careful to make sure that I've gotten down in there with rubber, wetted it out and pushed that in there. Really nice. Good. We're going to start to build out the mold with the other pieces of rubber. And we're going to, I want to really wet out this tip. Like, like, like crazy amounts of globby glue. Jam it on there. There. That makes a really nice fill out. But I also really want to get it built up. Built up like down here like that. Build that up. Just letting that rubber run down in there and fill that well. Again, and bubbles that are in there are going to rise out. Another reason that the bubbles don't matter in a rotation mold is that I'm never going to put this mold under pressure. So even if there are some bubbles trapped in the rubber, it doesn't really matter that much. Because I'm not ever going to put this mold under pressure, it means that there are no bubbles to collapse and distort the mold. If the mold's put under pressure, obviously, uh, it could collapse bubbles that's caught inside the thing, and you could get slight distortions in your mold. But that, in this case, is not going to happen. So that is a big advantage to us. And if it drips, and if it carries on and does weird things, then it's okay too. It doesn't really hurt it. This has just been a process of building layer after layer after layer. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put these pieces on to continue building the parting line. So I'm going to put this piece on now on this ridge. And again, this is just the rubber that's going to create and support that parting line. Goober up this ridge really well. There's not a lot of rubber up on top of that ridge right now. That's something that's a concern to me are all these sharp edges. So I'm going to put a good goober of rubber on there all the way down to the end. I'm going to put a nice, nice, generous wet out of rubber on this surface. Glue this stuff on there really well. Don't want to starve it at the end. So make sure it's well glued. So you can see in this process that you can build this rubber in layers. I've been building this piece over the course of several days. So you can build rubber molds over time, like I've been doing this one. You don't have to, you know, pour it all in one day or whatnot. You can pour it over time. And I'm just going to hold this, tack this piece to the end with a straight pin. And that is going to be more than sufficient to hold it in place. Come along the ridge and do the exact same thing on the other side. Just tack it into place. And I created a rubber landing on each end. So there's that's pinned and it's quite secure. And that'll hold that nicely in place. And I want to make sure I come up on these ridges because those are my greatest concern. I want to make sure I've got thick rubber ridges on each of the projection ridges that stick out from the mold. That's really going to be important. Just build it on up. I started, as you can see, with some of the pink rubber. Now, the, the red rubber hardener is for this job of building brush-on molds. But I have to say, using this hardener, this rapid set hardener, with the conventional pouring rubber produces a, a, a very similar effect in the rubber uh, and has really worked out well. I've been pretty pleased with this. That's just another way to go. See how thick and goopy that is? That is super thick and super goopy. And I'm just building up the edges. I want to make sure, because you don't want a mold that's floppy. You really, truly do not want a floppy mold. Let me get this uh, building up these ridges. I've always said that building a brush on mold, just like frosting a cake. You just put the stuff on. Just keep building. So I'm going to spare you guys the unbearable tedium of watching me do this because this is just takes layer after layer after layer. Didn't want to say, if this was a client job, I would not do it this way. This is way, way, way too time intensive to make any money doing this. Had this been a client job, what I would have done is simply build a box. Just carefully sized so that I got even wall thickness, I would have built a box and I just would have poured it solid. That would have been so much faster, so much easier. I could have made this mold in 
essentially just a, you know, a few, some layers, but just some, one single pour. It would have only taken uh, a few hours at the most. This was a very material friendly, but labor intensive method of doing this. The rest of this project is just about building just layer, 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 until I feel like it's safely built up on all edges. The question is how thick does a rubber blanket mold have to be? And the answer is it has to keep its shape. It has to be just thick enough to keep its shape. And that depends on how big the object is you're making. For instance, if you're making, if you got a blanket mold, here's my blanket mold. If you're making a small object, you know, like, like this, a little object like that, you can see this rubber is holding its shape. It's keeping its shape just fine. Can you see that? See how that rubber's, see how that rubber's holding its shape? And that's fine. So this would be a thick enough blanket because then you could put a shell around it and everything would be beautiful. But what if your object was this big? What would happen? It, it's, it's not gonna hold its shape. It's floppy, it's, it's bendy, it's, it's just, it's not gonna hold its shape. And if you try to put this into a, and you say, well, it's gonna go in a shell, the shell will support it, except it won't. It'll, it, it could wrinkle, it could, you know, you want to get in, it doesn't work. So there's a ratio. The wall thickness of the rubber blanket has to be in proportion to the size of the thing you're making. If you're making a great big thing, you're gonna have a thick rubber blanket. And in fact, you're probably gonna to wanna to build ribs and all kinds of stuff because otherwise this thing's gonna become a monster. You just get a feel for it. I can't give you the exact number of you know, the proportion of size of object to thickness of rubber because it varies with the rubber you're using. Some rubbers are very hard and stiff. Some are really floppy and flexible. Uh, so it really, you have to, with the rubber that you're using, figure out what the optimal thickness is. But what you want is rubber that holds its shape and then you're gonna have a good blanket mold because you'll be able to pop it in and out of the shell and, and when it rotates around, it's not gonna be flopping around inside of the shell, you know, which is a bad, really bad. I'm gonna finish this up. I'm just gonna keep, keep putting layer after layer on this mold until it's built up and you'll see it when it's all done. Next week, we're gonna put on the shell and here's the thing about that. I'm gonna do a shell in a way that I haven't done a shell before and that is we're gonna use fiberglass to build the shell just to be different and just to show a different method, and that'll be a lot of fun. Hey, if you like this video, watch this video next and keep your projects coming, keep your comments coming, keep your questions coming. You guys know I love hearing from you and I will see you next week.